the Cowboys have a decision to make. Jerry Jones and Mike McCarthy. We, it, it's no surprise that the discussion is about McCarthy's job after the beatdown that we saw the Green Bay Packers hand to Dallas on Sunday. Back-to-back 12-win seasons coming into this year. Another 12-win season. And it's not perception. It is reality that Dallas and the, the Cowboys organization, when it hits January, they don't pick up where they left off throughout the four, first few months of the season. They were dominant throughout the year. Their offense scored. They win at home. They had not lost since the opening game in 2022. And here they are, bags packed and ready to go home uh, down the road in Texas because, well, they're done. The Packers didn't just win. They crushed them. It was a beatdown, a boat race. And Mike McCarthy's job should be in jeopardy. It should be up uh, based on results in the postseason. Because we've said for years, Chad, Jerry Jones isn't getting any younger. And I, for one, believe it or not, want to see the Cowboys win. I do. I want to see them get back to the top of the mountain one more time. Jerry Jones has, uh, what he's meant to the league, uh, what we've uh, come to know him as, as one of the owners, and the whole story behind America's team, I do want to see them, see them uh, reach that threshold. It's not going to be with McCarthy. Greg, oh, Greg Olson said on the broadcast yesterday, and I, by the way, I like, the, I like the broadcast with what they do, him and Burkhart, really do. Uh, but he said, hey, if, if, if the question is if he's, on the, if he's on the open market to be hired, would he be hired if you fired him? If the answer is yes, well, you have your answer of whether or not you should fire him. I mean, at some point, you reach your ceiling. And this is Mike McCarthy reaching his ceiling with the Cowboys. They were outcoached. The game plans on both sides of the football did not work. This is a Packers team that gave up 30 points three weeks ago to the Carolina Panthers. And the Carolina Panthers turned around and did not score a single point the final two weeks following scoring 30 on this Packers defense. And the Cowboys didn't come out and play like we just saw the Detroit Lions do at home on Sunday night. It was the opposite. They came out flat. The defense didn't record a single sack. And Jordan Love picks up his first playoff win on the road. Looks like C.J. Stroud going against the Cleveland Browns defense. And, well, here we are sitting here talking about the Cowboys not in the postseason anymore. And it's par for the course. I think McCarthy is going to be looking for another gig. I do, especially with Bill Belichick and Mike Rabel available. Crazy to think that, and I I agree with you, by the way, Hutton. I think this is it for Mike McCarthy in Dallas. Crazy to think about a guy, though, that's won 12-plus games in three straight seasons. And he's going to be looking for a job. But, hey, this is life in, in big business, and it's definitely the life in Big D. And when Jerry Jones and Stephen Jones get that roster to a point where they expect not just making the playoffs or just winning the division or any of that, or the number two seed in the NFC, they expect to win in the playoffs. Just making it is not enough, right? Once they get to that point, you've got to deliver. And I don't know what's going on here. I'm not ready to put all the blame on Mike McCarthy for that game against the Packers. That was just a thorough embarrassment and a thorough beatdown from the Packers. They could have picked and told what they were going to do to the Cowboys in any play and done it. Aaron Jones dominated. They could throw it when they wanted. They had design plays from Matt LaFleur that made him look like a play-calling genius at times with guys streaking wide open down the field, catching the ball like a center fielder. They're so open with no Cowboys defenders around. It, It was an embarrassment. Everyone needs to wear it. Everyone needs to face it. But something is off with that team, either feeling the pressure coming out unprepared, C.D. Lamb and Dak Prescott. I'm not saying that they don't like each other or that there's big-time chemistry issues, but it does not take a genius in football arithmetic to watch that performance in the playoffs on the biggest stage and not say what is obvious. There is something off. And what is the easiest thing to do to recalibrate and to try to fix it if you're Jerry Jones? It's not getting rid of the quarterback that's got 59 million plus against the cap next year. It's not retooling your defense or retooling your receiving core. The roster's in place. The easiest thing to do for Jerry and Steven Jones right now is to get rid of the coach. I don't know if that's the right decision or not, but Hutton, I agree with you that it is going to be the decision, I believe, because it's the one thing that he can control to try to upset the apple cart and get some sort of a different result come playoff time. Well, we've seen it three years in a row now. It's a pattern. 
And I do think there's some pressure just putting on that uniform, putting on that jersey and the helmet. I do. Uh, they haven't been to a conference championship game since 95. The Packers are 6-0 and at AT&T Stadium. They have more playoff wins in that stadium than the Cowboys do. Put that into perspective. The, the Packers picked up their third playoff win in the stadium, including the Super Bowl win, Aaron Rodgers' lone Super Bowl, and the Cowboys have two. Prescott is not a big game quarterback. He's just not. You mentioned the, the connection with CeeDee Lamb. They had that throughout the season. But a midway through the season, CeeDee Lamb was demanding the football, and he got the damn ball, as he put it. And he put up numbers. He said he was the best receiver in the league. He looked like it for a stretch. Not yesterday. They were not in sync. Aaron Jones, you, good shout out there because he had not been consistent at all. Injuries hurt that consistency issue, but just not good during the regular season. He's back. He dominates the Cowboys. He now has nine touchdowns in five games against the Cowboys, I believe is the number I saw. Just dominant. Uh, four games, actually, against the Cowboys. That's got to change, especially with that defense and the way it was playing throughout the year. It was them and Cleveland, and both of those defenses went down against quarterback play that stepped up when it needed to step up for their offense. And credit to Jordan Love and credit to C.J. Stroud. Yeah, where was Micah Parsons in that defense? That was that was so disappointing uh, to watch that effort from them. Um, yeah, it's again, it's it's so difficult though because it would be easy if they went out there and they were terrible this year and they didn't make the playoffs. Well, then it's an easy call: right. get rid of Mike McCarthy and try to do something different. But to me, it makes it so much harder because they were successful. They did win the division. They did get the number two seed. It was set up for them. To beat the number seven seed, oh, by the way, first ever win for a seven seed in NFL playoffs, but get through that round, and then it was set up perfectly for them to possibly make some hay and, and, and reach the Super Bowl. And instead, you have that performance where 48 to 32 uh, honestly was deceiving. It was much worse than that in the game. That was only because of a late Cowboys run. Was it even that close? And it, it just leaves me feeling like something needs to be done and the easiest thing to do to change things and to change the dynamic drastically is to fire the coach. So that's what I expect them to do. What well, is the drastic change to go to Bill Belichick? 71-year-old Bill Belichick, who would come in for 81-year-old Jerry Jones to go win a Super Bowl. The, the discussion behind the scenes for a, a, a recent history has been that Jerry Jones and Bill Belichick have, have grown to become friends over the recent years. If that's true, he's available and you've got a coach who has won championships, and Jerry wants one more. He's got to get it. And Belichick could do that as long as he's got the structure in place. And by the way, Jerry would be the general manager. He's not giving that up. And he's put together a talented roster. The question I would have is, how many coaches right now would want to go coach Dak Prescott? It's, it, it's not a, a, an easy decision. I think I know the answer. The answer is yes, based on the quarterbacks across the league. But also, I mean, is this the end of the road for him based on what we've seen? And, and by the way, loved his answer when asked about McCarthy. That is, that is as definitive of having your coaches back and wanting him back as a quarterback could be, putting himself out there too, saying, hey, I, I'm on the hot seat too then. And no, it shouldn't be an issue. But... In thinking about the options, Prescott will get you there to the postseason. But in the moment, is he going to win four games for you? Is he going to help you win and step up and make that play? And yesterday it was over before the game even really started. I don't know how anyone could say yes to that question, Hutton. I don't know how anyone with a straight face can say, yes, Dak Prescott is going to be that quarterback that wins you the requisite amount of games to win a Super Bowl because he just – Hasn't proven that so far. Dak Prescott's a very talented quarterback. He's had a great statistical season. He's a good NFL quarterback. He lacks it. I've felt this way about Dak Prescott since his second or third year in the league where he was shot out of a cannon uh, when he first started with the Cowboys where, I mean, it's clear, you know, not a first-round guy, but uh, over-delivered for that Cowboys organization. He lacks it. Whatever that unidentifiable, you can't quite de de define what it is. He doesn't have it for that Cowboys team. Now, would Bill Belichick want to work with Dak Prescott? I, I think Bill Belichick wants to coach football. And I see Dallas now as one of the best available jobs if it comes open. 
when we start to go down the list, if we're ranking situations in the NFL of open jobs, it's right up there. It's right up there with, let's say, the Chargers. Why is the Chargers up there? Because Justin Herbert. Now, where are you putting Dak Prescott with Justin Herbert? Uh, obviously behind him. Justin Herbert hasn't shown he can do anything, even getting to the playoffs. That's right. He's had one playoff win also. So I think any big-name coach that takes either one of those jobs, you're going into that job with a big question mark at quarterback when it comes to performance in prime time. And I'm not talking about Sunday night football on NBC prime time. I'm talking playoffs. I'm talking getting to the to the tournament and performing in that tournament. And, and that's something that we just have not seen from Dak Prescott, who inflated his numbers yesterday late in the game. But as he said, had a terrible game. And I agree with you, Hutton. I love the, the self-awareness mm. of Dak Prescott to say, if he's on the hot seat, I'm on the hot seat. Because I was awful in that game. We were awful. That, that was trash. I respect a guy who will at least admit that and not duck and cover and act like, the reality isn't reality. Dallas was on the short list of teams that would be interested or could be interested in trading for Belichick when all the stuff was going down in November. Uh, keep this in mind, too. Stephen Jones loves Mike Vrabel. Loves the dude. Vrabel's also available. So the question would be, are you, in essence, trading Mike McCarthy in the final year of his contract next year for Belichick or for Vrabel? And what's different about the Cowboys to what we've seen with uh, other, uh, for instance, Herbert. The difference is the defense. Chargers defense has been awful. And now you would pick up with Dallas's defense and you're picking up a franchise that has won 12 games, three seasons in a row. They're the first team though, to not make a conference championship game in NFL history after winning three straight seasons of, of 12 victories. Uh, craziness. I, mean, a, I believe either one of those guys that you just brought up, either Belichick or Vrabel, is an upgrade in Dallas as a head yeah. coach. I, I really do. Here's my one question, though, if I'm Jerry Jones, to both those guys. I have one question. Who is your offensive coordinator? And if I don't like that answer, I, I'm not hiring those guys. That is the most important part to me of Vrabel and now Belichick moving forward. Who are they going to pair with them, themselves as offensive coordinator on that staff? Because that is a spot that Mike Vrabel did not get right well, after well. Arthur Smith left. For the Falcons, is it Arthur Smith? Right, it is. I think that they're bringing. There? I think they both have easy answers. I think they go back to what they know and who they had when they were good at offense. Uh, Arthur Smith and Josh McDaniels. Like that's yeah. who. That's who I would bring. I would run it back, and you drop the coaches in. The roster's there, and you're off and running. I mean, I, I, that's how I would roll with it. And they tried to do it this year by switching offensive coordinators in Dallas. Kellen Moore was out, and Mike McCarthy was calling plays for a bit. Uh, and then took back over, and then what? whatever uh, the hesitation was. Uh, they weren't good at certain spots. And, and look, Dak is good in the regular season. But you've got to get over that hump. and Whatever, whatever that is, and it even didn't work in, at home, where he has been dominant, the team has been dominant, winning by 20-plus points. Not happening in, in the postseason, no matter where they are. Chad, there's a, the door was cracked for Dak to make that leap, to jump into the room, jump a, a one more shelf higher into the great category for quarterbacks right now in the National Football League, the elite quarterbacks right now in this era of the NFL. He didn't do it. But there's another quarterback that plays today, Josh Allen, who also has that status, who has a wide-open AFC currently not just based on what we saw in the regular season, a Bills team that hit its stride at the right time going into the playoffs. They have the number two seed. The playoffs will go through them, if not for Baltimore. But Kansas City is sitting there waiting to potentially go through Buffalo. And it's a playoff in the AFC that does not fe feature Joe Burrow. Kansas City is just is not Kansas City. And what we've seen, they're scoring 21 points a game at best. There's no Aaron Rodgers with New York. There's no Justin Herbert. There's no talented Jags roster. They would have to go through a rookie-led Houston Texans team and then go beat the Ravens in Baltimore by not turning the football over, by being the good version of Josh Allen. This is his opportunity to become one of the perceived great quarterbacks 
in the NFL because after that playoff loss where he didn't get the football in overtime and they changed the rules based on that game, I th- and, and the way they followed up the next season where they were, they became America's team. Everyone thought Buffalo was, was the team primed to go to the Super Bowl and win it. That didn't happen. And then they took a, a step back in the perception of, okay, which teams are we following? Miami kind of took their spot. Miami's also fool's gold. I don't think Buffalo is. I think they're built to win in the postseason. They're running the football extremely well. Their defense has improved. Josh Allen needs to be able to play quality quarterback. Can he do it? Because if he does, he's right back up there, and he's more or less, he's not Mahomes, but he's right there. With no Burrow, he takes over that spot and solidifies it. It's time to go take it. There's that classic Seinfeld episode where George Costanza declares everything the summer of George, that it was the summer of George, right? Yeah. Well, this was the autumn of C.J. Stroud. This was the autumn of Lamar Jackson in the AFC. It was not the autumn of Patrick Mahomes. Can it be the winter of Josh Allen or the winter of Mahomes? Is now the time for those guys to step up? Or are we going to continue seeing more of the storyline of what we saw throughout the fall because uh, step one complete for C.J. Stroud. He was incredible in that playoff win for the Browns. He he looks great, and he looks like a force to be reckoned with in the AFC for years to come. Super impressed with him. But Hutton, you nailed it. C.J. Stroud, with all of his greatness, he's not making the play we saw Josh Allen make to close out the Dolphins and win the AFC East. When he gets loose on a rollout and he's pinned up against the sideline and he runs for 12 to 15 yards and he bulls over a linebacker in the process and gets that play. He has the ability to make plays on his own. I dare say even more than Patrick Mahomes that we've seen this year. He's got that within him. Big test now starting in the playoffs. Is this going to be the magical run for the Buffalo Bills? Josh Allen has the ability to do it. But I'm also, it's not just Burrow not being involved in it. Is Lamar Jackson, you know, we talked about yeah, the Cowboys right. not playing well in the playoffs. Is Lamar Jackson going to do anything in the playoffs at any point in his career? That That's a big question mark for him. CJ Stroud, he's one for one right now. I'm looking at all the quarterbacks that are left and it's fascinating to me because there's a storyline with all of them. And it's not been the, a good year for Josh Allen, but by his standard, as one of the three or four best quarterbacks in the NFL, it has not been a good season for him. He had a chance, and when he had it, he took it. And the Bills went on that run just to get in the playoffs. And now that they're there, they're hosting a game. They have a chance to host multiple games. I I really want to see if this is the year Josh Allen, even after a disappointing regular season, can put it all together for that run that every Cowboys fan has been begging for their team to make in the postseason, and and Allen is capable to do it. Yeah, and I didn't mention Lamar because Lamar is going to be your MVP. And, you know, again, he's the he's perceived to be right there, neck and neck, but Mahomes has got the lead. But this AFC, based on just the how dominant it looked going into the season, if you said, hey, Josh Allen's going to be in the postseason and he's not facing Aaron Rodgers, there's no Joe Burrow, And by the way, Mahomes throws in the regular season for 1,000 fewer yards and 12 fewer touchdowns than he did the prior year. It's not like this is the Mahomes throwing for 5,000 yards. It's not. They've got issues. Now, they can win, but they've got issues. And you're not going to Arrowhead. That's the other thing. Arrowhead's not Arrowhead, only when it's cold, extremely cold. But Buffalo is too. The weather issues are legit. If you're going to try to strive to play these games at high mark, Take advantage of this. Take advantage of opening up against Pittsburgh in a season where they look dead to rights and we may see Mike Tomlin take a step back in a year off. It's, a, it's, a, it's set up for Josh Allen. It really is. I think the table is set for Josh Allen. Um, and I think after watching that game last night, I think the table's set for the Detroit Lions. Uh, w- what a story that is, Hutton. That's one that I said last week, I feared the worst for the Lions. It just felt like, the movie was set up for the perfect ending and it was going to have the worst ending that was going to leave people getting up out of the movie theater and running to vomit in the bathroom <laughs> afterward. And that's the way I felt last night. I wanted to throw up. I wanted to throw up on behalf of all Lions fans because I saw it coming. 
you could feel it when they're driving. It's 24 to 20. I'm thinking, oh, goodness, here it comes. Matthew Stafford, who was incredible, by the way. It was the game of the year. In that game, even battling the injuries, incredible in that game. Did everything he could to win. Puka Nakua looks like an unstoppable force. Credit Davey Hudson for calling that out in the preseason. Yeah. That this guy was going to be so great. Couldn't do anything with him. And I'm thinking, here we go. They're going to go right down, score a touchdown. Jared Goff is going to then throw an interception while driving. <laughs> and that is going to end the game. And then everyone's going to say, see, told you. There you go. That's why you trade for Matthew Stafford. Already won the one Super Bowl. L.A. knew it. Sean McVay knew it. They get, got rid of Jared Goff at the right time. Guy can't win in big game circumstances. He's the reason they lost that Super Bowl to the Patriots. They went and got their guy. They won a Super Bowl. Now they're going to go win another one. And instead, the script flipped. And Jared Goff, who was great from the start of that game, they call a ballsy play call on third down. Dan Campbell and his staff, credit them. They pick up the first down, and they're able to work the clock and win the game. Incredible. I, I, amazing scene in Detroit. And I do want to thank the Lions and the Rams because the Rams were a big part of this also. Uh, also. That 24-23 win for the Lions has so far saved Super Wild Card Weekend because these were some really bad games over the weekend, 45-14. to 14, 26 to 7, 48 32. That wasn't even that close. Average margin of victory, 22 points per game. And then here comes the miraculous, the heroic Detroit Lions to win it 24 to 23 in front of what was by far the best atmosphere of the weekend in Detroit. You got NBC cutting to 89 year old fans who have had season tickets for 66 years. I got chill bumps just talking about it. It was an awesome scene. In Detroit, I love it when fan bases that have not experienced really any success get a taste of success. Where the Cowboys, it felt like if you're a Cowboys fan, hey, we've been here a lot, but it feels like we're going to choke when we get there. And that is now what the Cowboys are. They're chokers for the Lions. Yeah, and for the Lions, they did not do that. Playoff games, they're never in the playoffs. Yeah, they're, they're never there. So they're thinking, well, this is new to us. This is great. But you could feel the nerves even of the fans as that game went on to not wanting to lose to Matthew Stafford because that would have just further vindicated everything that's already been vindicated because the Rams already won their Super Bowl. Let's get the Detroit Lions their Super Bowl now. I want nothing more now that the Browns completely look terrible and Joe Flacco looked like a 39-year-old guy about to be 39 that was on the couch all year for this one game. Let's get the Lions and the Bills to the Super Bowl. That is what I want to see. Stamp it. Make it happen. Detroit looked really good in that first game, and they survived what was a terrific game. And thank God for it, because none of the other games were any good. No, they were not. And, you know, people point blame to, well, this is the wild card weekend with the seven seed. We saw the seven seed just uh, destroy Dallas, right? So, again, like, it's not just that issue. This is just the league this year, except – when two quarterbacks show up on the same day, and that's what we saw. I mean, that, some of these stats will run together. This is incredible, though, this stat pool. Jared Goff and Matthew Stafford both completed 65% of their passes or better. They threw for 250 or more yards. They averaged 10 or more yards per attempt in the game and did not turn the football over. That has never happened with two quarterbacks in the same game in the NFL. That's regular season or postseason. That you is, could that, right they, they've been tracking this since 1950. That's crazy. Hunt, you could tell right away. I mean, there were just some throws being made. On that first drive from yeah. Jerry Goff, where he is just ripping the ball into tight windows. How well, many times did Matthew Stafford throw a sidearm no-look pass to someone in that game and make it look easy? I, I was blown away by the high-level quarterback play. That is what I want to see in the regular season, which we didn't get to see enough of this year. I hope that's a preview now of what's to come with the rest of the NFL playoffs, because that was, that was just fun to watch. I mean, that, that game, it was awesome. Uh, th that's the best way I can articulate it. It was awesome to watch on both sides throughout the atmosphere that came with it. Everything was incredibly cool. And I'm so happy that the lions found a way uh, in that game to get it done and pretty cool seeing the emotion of those lions fans. And they finally got that win. Yeah, I feel, I feel great for them. Yeah. And it, you mentioned the start to the game for golf. Compare that to Dak Prescott. Like, Ooh. that's the difference right there. The, the Cowboys start versus the Lions start at home 
where all eyes are on you to go win the game. And what an atmosphere at Ford Field. Um, we, get, we need to mention Kansas City, but from the flip side. Miami was dead on arrival. I was not expecting them to show up that cold, that frozen. But, I mean, if we're going to talk about the Cowboys, let's talk about Miami. They, they are the regular season version of Dallas just turned down a notch. They put up a bunch of points. They're an offense that scored 70 this season. But they go in the cold, and it was cold. And we see Kansas City stick to what they know. And meanwhile, all, we, all I could see from Miami was Mike, McDan- Mike McDaniel frozen on the sideline and Tua doing absolutely nothing in that game. Well, I thought that last touchdown for the Chiefs that really blew it open by Clyde Edwards-Hilaire kind of summed up the game. If you just want to play one play and show what that game looked like, watch Jalen Ramsey try to thud it up on Clyde Edwards-Hilaire and and have no interest in tackling on that play as he just walks into the end zone where the Dolphins were defeated. And to me, they were defeated long before that. They had no interest in hitting in that game. They had no interest in tackling. That was not a really good offensive effort from the Chiefs even. It was more about the Dolphins being bad. And the game leaves me with one question, Hutton, and I'm going to pose it to you first. Is Tua any good? Because uh, that's where the Dolphins are right now. I, I don't know. He's good. If you would ask me this question in mid-October, if, if the I'd have a very different answer. If, if the outside factors, right, the, the weather, uh, Tyreek Hill's playing, and he's uh, the if everyone around him is there, they show up, and the conditions are right, he's good. He's really good. Some of the throws we've seen him make this season and last season before he had the concussion are incredible. But he's not consistent. And uh, there's a lot of things that have to go right in a game for Tua to be right in a game. And I I think that's what it comes down to. And the decision now comes to the contract. It's a lot like Justin Fields, just uh, a, a tougher decision, a much tougher decision. Yeah, and the question I have, look, I think Tua, clearly, statistically, he's been good at times with the Dolphins. The secondary question of that is, would any NFL quarterback that's decent look good with that supporting cast and that speed, the way Tua does? Is he being elevated by everyone else, right? That's the big question. It's kind of the same thing with Kirk Cousins, right? Justin Jefferson was the one guy in the league that got all the credit for any Kirk Cousins success. Are we giving Tua on the flip side of that too much credit simply because he has a great supporting cast, a good offensive system with Mike McDaniel, and he's getting all the shine off of that where he's really not deserving of it, and there's 17 quarterbacks in the NFL that could do even better than Tua Tungabailoa does in Miami? I'm left asking that question. I I don't know, but I'm asking that question throughout the game on Saturday night because, look, I, I predicted it. By the way, Kelly in Vegas should have taken my bet on that when I pitched it. Yeah, you're right. Tua wanted nothing to do with that weather. I, I knew it going into it, and he was awful. And I, I just watched it, and I, we saw too much of that late in the season that I could put squarely on Tua and not on Mike McDaniel, not on the receivers, not on the Dolphins team, that he's got to clean up if they're ever going to reach their level of what they could reach, which is, uh, we you said it, they scored 70 at one point this season. It's a team talent-wise that could win a Super Bowl if they can put it together at quarterback. That certainly was not the case on Saturday night. And then regardless of conditions, Kansas City is going to score about 21 to 23 points. That's that's all you got to do, regardless of the outside factors. Divisional weekend sets up, and it's traditionally the best weekend that the NFL has to offer. And on Saturday, Houston is going to either go to Baltimore or they're going to take on Kansas City at Arrowhead. That will be followed by Green Bay winning at Dallas going to San Francisco and Brock Purdy, who is uh, the other version of the Lamar Jackson factor, uh, the guy that can take over and make a run to a Super Bowl. Sunday's matchups, Detroit back at home, and they'll kick off against either Tampa Bay, if Tampa Bay wins over Philadelphia, or the Eagles. They'll advance and take on Detroit in what's going to be a fun matchup regardless. And I love that for Detroit. They're, I'm looking at that. They cannot look ahead. The fans want to start dreaming now. That's a great matchup for the Lions. And then Sunday's nightcap on CBS, follow uh, NBC, then CBS. You've got Kansas City and uh, Pittsburgh, and they will be headed to either Buffalo or Baltimore. So if Kansas City uh, wins, or excuse me, if, if Pittsburgh wins, 
They're headed to Baltimore. Kansas City headed to Buffalo. Hutton, I keep thinking about this scenario in the NFC. Philly wins tonight, and yep. then now they're going to Detroit. Right? Yes, that, that's yes. what feels to me right and like what we're going to see next weekend. Detroit's able to win that game at home, beat Philly, and then Green Bay finds a way to replicate that effort against Dallas, and they beat San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Then you have Detroit and Ford Field, which you, Hutton, who are on the sideline of almost every NFL stadium over your years with two. the Titans, said that it was one of the loudest places, it is. right, Ford Field. Underrated. Uh, imagine Ford Field now and the Detroit Lions hosting the NFC Championship game and the team they have to beat to get to the Super Bowl in Vegas is the hated Green Bay Packers within their own division that's on a miracle run of their own with Jordan Love as the last seed and the last team to get in the NFC playoffs. Sign me up for that. I keep thinking about that. I also keep thinking, you know, San Francisco's pretty damn good. So they're probably likely to win that game at home. But wouldn't that be cool if you got to see Detroit and Ford Field and that atmosphere from last night host not one, not two, but three playoff games in that venue? It would be amazing. Also amazing is the, the weather uh, across the country. Uh, and we're seeing it in Buffalo where – and Orchard Park, they're in the middle of uh, just a deluge of snow, ice, and terrible conditions where the game has moved off of Saturday to today. They're playing the game. You see the Steelers fans arriving to the stadium with the snow in the stands. Uh, they're playing it. They're kicking off. And – Unlike what we saw from Miami, Pittsburgh is is built for these conditions too. This is going to be a tight, low-scoring game, in my opinion, Chad. And which team can establish the run? But also, without T.J. Watt, how does that affect what Pittsburgh does defensively against Allen and Buffalo? The conditions with shoveling snow, everything else. We know this, and you know this because of your family members who are massive Bills fans. Bills Mafia? They're going to find something to do with all the snow in the stands. Are they going to be throwing it in celebration? Or are they going to be booing and be upset and angry based on a performance where the Bills have it set up perfectly? Yeah, that entire fan base is drunk as piss right now. Yeah. That is one thing that I can Frozen guarantee. Frozen tables that. are being broken. Oh, and guys are just, you know, pissing in the trash can inside of the restrooms uh, at Highmark Stadium right now. Uh, everyone out there that we're seeing shovel snow is also drunk. That is one thing I can guarantee about Bills fans at this point. Bills Mafia, uh, they don't need excuses to party. And uh, one big excuse, though, they don't even need is a playoff game hosted in Western New York. So they are ready to go. That is one way to combat the cold is to get really, really stupid drunk. Yes. And that's exactly yes. what Bills fans have done all day. Uh, my brother-in-law is here. Uh, he's in seven inches of snow about three miles from me right now. And I guarantee you he's also pissed drunk ready for this game, but he'll be watching on television and celebrating the Bills in the playoffs. So that's one thing I know about Bills Mafia and Bills fans. Hutton, I think that it is just how you laid out earlier, though. I look at this game. I think about all the storylines with Mike Tomlin and is he going to sit out for a year in that. But the first thing that comes to mind is one name, Josh Allen. This is Josh Allen's not just game to manage in this weather at home. This is Josh Allen's opportunity to cement himself as, a, let's, let's face it, not just a Buffalo legend, which he already is, but an NFL legend if he can lead this team to a Super Bowl and get the Bills that elusive championship. That's the opportunity in front of him, and it starts this game against Pittsburgh. And I expect a low-scoring game in these conditions, and it could come down to who can manage it better, who can make some plays with their legs. That's Josh Allen. That could be his specialty in the game. One thing he can't do, though, that we saw him do throughout this season when the Bills were bad, he cannot lose it for them. He cannot make the critical mistakes that we saw early in the year. I think about that opener against the Jets where he lost the game for them with some bad mistakes. Can't do that in this one. I don't expect him to. This is the winter of Josh Allen. And it may be an offseason of top coaches. It already is uh, available for other teams. Uh, Mike Tomlin, I mentioned this last week, I was hearing rumblings that he was uncertain about his future in Pittsburgh. This could be his final game as Steelers head coach by his decision. He's got another year left on his contract, but he may decide to step away at least for a year. And he's consulting with his family about that. 
before he makes the call. The Steelers, according to reports, want him under contract and want to give an extension. Doesn't sound like he's interested in signing that. If he returns, it will be on the lame duck year, and then he will decide his future. However, Steelers say they're not going to fire him. That's through pro football talk. And I think the interesting move here is Pittsburgh still would hold his rights if he decides to go to TV, much like Sean Payton, and they get to hit the hit the coaching pool in a year where, I mean, there are plenty to choose from, veteran coaches, young coaches. And one thing we know about the Steelers organization, they don't miss from the Steelers' point of view and who they choose to hire. Mike Vrabel is a perfect fit for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Perfect. Do they turn that way? Don't know. Maybe someone within the organization is where they turn because they're really good at finding those guys. But just keep in mind, Tomlin is consulting with his family, no matter win or lose, whatever, to decide his his future with the Steelers. And he's been there since 2007. Doesn't seem that long. Been there since 2007. And he's never had a losing season, including this one where it was, he was in, it was a dire situation midway through the year. Hunt, do you feel like if he steps away, that he's definitely going to sit out a year or that he's stepping away from Pittsburgh with the thought that maybe I'll go somewhere else right now just because it's time in Pittsburgh and it's time to move on? It's, I, I think he would sit out a year to just it, – it's something, again, consulting with his family. Maybe he's, he's, he's got burnout. There's something there. And there's also something within the uh, a layer too deeper – about this whole situation, you know, with the surprising report from Peter King that he was hearing Tomlin was on the hot seat to now Tomlin's trying to decide if he wants to be there. There's more to it than just wanting to rest and relax and recharge. We'll we'll hear the final story at some point, but I think it would be a year uh, because again, he, he's in maybe, maybe teams are still waiting to see what happens there too. And he would be with Pete Carroll and Belichick and Vrabel I mean, this is a, a great spot if you're a team looking to, to flip coach. Philadelphia, if they lose, what would happen with Sirianni? Mike McCarthy is also there. And then you have the Pittsburgh team, uh, the, the Steelers, who are open to hire again. It's a lot of good landing spots for some coaches that have been really good uh, throughout their tenures. And it starts with Belichick, who is not, he's not finished by any means. 